Hi folks, welcome to the I Write Radio podcast videocast. Um, Sunday, we've had Mar and in Scotland, Gordon Brewer. Um, I think if we go with Mar, that will bring in most of what we want to cover today, guys. Uh, Nicholas Sturgeon was interviewed on Mar, as was Gove. Um, and I think basically start there and see where it takes us. Stuart. Nicholas Sturgeon on Mar, what did you think? Accomplished. Uh, too much eye makeup. Um, <laughs> I, like pre- I like to focus on presentation, you know. Um, but she was a, a, a very accomplished as usual. I thought, to be honest, I thought Andrew was very, was quite gentle with her. Uh, I don't know whether they're, they're, they're personal friends. They could be these days with the way the world is. And after, and after all, he was recently in Scotland. His father died of, I think, of coronavirus. And uh, so goodness knows where. I, I was sat there thinking maybe he, she sent him a nice card or something. Um, the, the, the fiery answers, right, we had two or three, but the one that caught my attention was the ones that, quote, asked about whether she would be, he did ask her, look, you, you, he said, you've not really been talking about independence up to now. Uh, other people are asking. And, she's, and her careful, re, careful reply was that she no longer, when she no longer needs to focus on coronavirus and the economic legacy of coronavirus, then she'll look at independence. Now, she, other people are saying, including Craig Murray, Angus McNeil, all kinds of other people are commenting on social media that that seems to mean that she's extending her purda, her personal purda and the purda of the SNP about campaigning for independence to include until the economy is sorted. It's not what I heard. Put it that way. What did, what did you hear? Well, basically, I mean, we're talking about July then there's nothing going to happen till the turn of the year because of the pandemic and the economy will be a major issue. She'll not have a choice but to fight an independence view on the economy because Westminster will do the too poor, too stupid, too we argument on the economy when independence comes up. They're already doing it now. No, sorry, you've got me confused there, Nori. I thought... She's saying but she's well as but independence. She but not as long as the economy's not sorted. As usual, Stuart, you've jumped in before I got to the point. All right. <laughs> the point <laughs> is that argument's already been laid out. So she's not going to be able to avoid independence linked to the economy. So it's going to come up whether she likes it or not. Now it's going to be handy because when there's when it comes to difficult questions, she'll be able to say, Oh, I'm not talking about that. That's politics, and I'm still economy and pandemic mixed. But it's already started. So independence, as far as Westminster's concerned, is already an issue. You could say, I mean, the other side of the, your side of the argument is kind of there, that she's already talking about, on the one hand, she said she's not going to talk about independence. But on the other hand, in the, answering other questions to Mar, she said, for example, when Sunak, claimed that so without the broad shoulders of uh, the United Kingdom, Scotland couldn't have uh, supported its businesses and workers. Uh, and she pointed out, well, that simply because it's all done with borrowed money and Scotland was independent. So there was, she used the word. Um, well, Scotland could, you could have used, uh, could have borrowed the money. Well, we let her speak for herself. Absolutely. Because we have a clip. This is Nicholas Sturgeon on Mar this morning, answering the questions you just referred to. And in the course of that, I'm sure you've heard him say, no nationalist can endure, ignore the undeniable truth. This help has only been possible because we are a United Kingdom. And he was talking about a total of 4.6 billion pounds, which has gone to Scotland to help with COVID. He was right about that, wasn't he? Uh, no, and uh, fundamentally, I don't think he's right to be making uh, sort of overtly political points about this. I've tried throughout this not to do that because I think what we're dealing with right now is too important for that. But it's a nonsense argument. I mean, 
look across the world from the Republic of Ireland. I heard an interview with the Taoiseach uh, earlier on to uh, smaller countries all over uh, who have, in some respects, actually had bigger fiscal uh, stimulus than the UK. The, the issue here right now is that he holds the borrowing power. To Remember, this is borrowed money, um, and the people of Scotland will play their part in mm. repaying that borrowing just as people elsewhere in the UK. It's a, it's a right. limitation on the powers right now of the Scottish Government, meaning we have to rely on the Treasury. And if he wants to give more flexibility, which we've been asking for, uh, for the Scottish Government around borrowing in particular, then we can do more, uh, even than we are doing right now as the Scottish yeah. Government. But these kind of nonsense points, frankly, um, I think are... Uh, a bit regrettable and ridiculous, particularly given the severity of what we face. We're in the well, look, unfortunately, she didn't actually say independence there. In fact, what she seemed to be suggesting was that she simply wanted more power, more borrowing powers as a devolved government, which is a little worrying. See, I, I didn't get the, the where, where people get worried. That Sorry, Nicola, guys, you'll have to excuse me a sec. I, I didn't get where folk worry that Nicola's a gradualist and that she'd be happy with more powers. She, she's been in the party since she was a teenager and the reason debtor of the party is independence. The fact that she's taken a slower route than some people would like is probably because she's the leader of the party. She can't be as radical as people would like her to be. Oh, no, yeah, I mean, I, I can see both sides of this, Jimmy, quite, quite clearly. However, I'm still concerned that the possibility... I mean, there are other signals that uh, they're, the, the management, the top three or four at the SNP are not that fussed about moving towards another referendum as soon as a lot of us activists are. It's, you know, it's an ongoing argument. It, right. it goes on and on and on. And today, what with our, you know, by quoting this question of the economic issue, I think, well, I guess, I mean, I just, yeah, sorry. She, she, she can't avoid talking about independence. I mean, she can see that she wants to get through the, I mean, the reality is the economic aftermath of COVID could run for the next decade. She's never, she's not going to not talk about independence for 10 years, but I think where people get a bit worried is that they, they, they believe that they're too cosy in power, they're too happy with the status quo. Um, and I think as we watch Boris Johnson making an absolute pig's lug of COVID, and I think he'll do something very similar on Brexit. I think that the signs seem to be they're going to cobble together some nonsense deal that looks like a deal, smells like a deal, but is actually no deal. Um, and I think the economic fallout of that will be disastrous. So the, the economic um, fall throwback from COVID will be w less than Brexit. I think our economy is going absolutely doing the lave next year. And end of the day, Stuart, she's got to talk about independence because however she wants to try and frame next year's election, with the SNP sitting over 50% and we, yes, sitting over 50%, every second question is going to be about a referendum and when are you going to do it and when are we going to be no, independent? No, you're right. I mean, the New York Times has got another big article about it again this weekend about Scottish independence and the movement and the you know, and the 55% and all the rest of it. So they seem to be convinced that there's something going to happen. Well, I, I think Peter Curran's point is, is worth taking on board. Um, she, she's going to be tramlined into this. There's, she's not going to be able to avoid answering the question. Certainly, by the time we start campaigning for the Holyrood elections in May next year, she, she's going to have to have some sort of answer. Or they will, they will lose votes this time. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's an interesting we take in the Observer. Anne Applebaum's got an interesting article. I don't know if you've seen it, guys. It's worth a read just about the rise of the right in Eastern Europe and the the, the rise of populism with people like Johnston. You're sure you'll love it, mate. It's all about elites battling each other. But it's, it's a really interesting take because she was an insider. She's married to a senior Polish politician and was Kenny on the inside when all this uh, thing started kicking off we in wait, Poland. We're waiting for the results of the leadership of the election in Poland today, aren't Aye, we? That, that could be a pretty interesting election. Too close maybe. to call at the moment, is Aye, what I'm saying. So they say, yes. yeah, the, 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 the lib, more liberal mayor of Warsaw up against the existing prime minister. 
I've, I've been a bit run ragged this morning, but there was another article, and I think it was the Byline, Byline Times, um, effectively saying that uh, people needed to realise that the nationalism followed by the SNP was civic and welcoming and brought in the fact that so much of Europe seemed to be lurching to the right. Um, yeah. do, not, do not compare us to them sort of thing. It's noticeable how how many folk just chuck the word nationalism out there and didn't understand what particularly goes on in this country. Um, you didn't exactly ignore somebody when they tell you that all nationalism is wrong, but it certainly colours your view of them, the fact that they've not taken the time to understand what's going on here. And fortunate, unfortunately, there's a section of our press that's too lazy to find out what's going on. Well, I mean, the press are still trying to attack the Scottish government over the care home thing. I mean, Mar was at it again today. You know, um, again, we've got a wee clip of Nicola asking him if he could explain the excess deaths in England, right. which were basically the same as Scotland. I mean, Scotland doesn't seem to have done any better with the care, care home situation than England or the rest of Europe. It just seems that England is the only country that's just ignoring 20% of the deaths that can't be identified. Aye, just, oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. We, them. Aye. Aye, sure. no, that's what, more, that's what uh, Nicola Surgeon um, accused uh, them of doing, that, uh, that 50% of their uh, excess deaths in care homes in England are recorded, uh, are, are recorded as coronavirus caused. Whereas in Scotland and, and, and other countries, it's 70% that are caused by coronavirus. Uh, they, they, she accused them of under-recording. I think, I think we've seen that for the start, though. I think the deliberate of obfuscation for day one. You know, one day you're getting figures for England, one day you're getting figures for England and Wales, the next day you're getting just a United Kingdom figure. They've never wanted to be clear with what's happening. Well, um, Jackson Carlow was re tweeting yesterday about the lack of testing in Scotland. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't work out why he'd particularly gone with that one until it was reported in, was it The Guardian, that uh, <laughs> the Westminster government had been over-reporting testing in England by 200,000. Wow. Well, we saw week. that. We saw that even three or four weeks ago when they first started crowing about them, when they finally started getting testing done. But after after two after a couple of weeks, they dropped producing yeah. the report completely. Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, it, it, sorry, Jimmy, on you go. Sorry, I was just going to say it was kind of embarrassing this morning when people are asking, "Does test and trace work in Scotland?" When you look at what happened last weekend in Fries and Galloway, surely that points out that test and trace works in Scotland. I think I think there's a problem with the regular testing. And I don't think it's a Scottish government problem. I think it's a local health board problem. I think there's a difficulty in getting to where people need to be tested. I, people care home, people are expecting you to turn up at their door to test their staff. And I don't think that's happening. I don't think the health boards are set up to do that. Well, I'm curious to know why, uh, why it was kind of the headline interrogation by uh, Gordon Brewer this morning, wasn't it? I mean, that was his, his main attack. Mm -hmm. I think they've discovered that it's a confused picture and a confused picture they can say what they like about. But this idea that there is a bigger testing capacity in the government, the UK government testing um, abilities than there is in the NHS. And it appears that mm -hmm. that particular aspect is the aspect that's easiest for care home staff to go through but it's also a it's also a confusing situation about that um, because you've got um, one third of the uk capacity of uh, in, of testing is actually done in a lab in glasgow now how much of that do you count as in the scottish figures and how much do you not we don't know well the figure that was banded about this morning was twenty thousand. i take it that's a daily figure that's what was mentioned this morning so who knows who knows um, but the airports the army uh, seem to be where easiest place for staff to go to 
Um, well, look, at, I mean, I think they're, they're looking at, don't forget, the last time she stood in front of the lectern on Friday, we were told that there were approximately, reckon there were approximately a thousand people in Scotland who got the, the virus. This isn't not tested. This is just their calculation from their testing and everything else and people turning up in hospital, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody died for three days. There's no, there wasn't even an increase in um, I don't think there's even an increase in infections on, on the Saturday that's, that's figure. So, well, I've lost my track there. No, but you're well, right. Since there's been that divergence, since the Scottish government chose their own path, or sorry, the English government chose a path different from Scotland, Wales and Ireland, most of the numbers have gone in the right direction for Scotland. There's, there is definitely something to be pleased about. It's not got any worse. Um, things like testing, aye, it's awkward, but I mean, there was that boy the other week complaining about staff hadn't been tested in his Scottish care homes and in his English care homes, two thirds had been tested, but his Scottish care homes had had no cases. And at that point, as a care home operator, it's up to him. He's the one that phones the, the hotline and tells the, whoever's at the end of the hotline, that he needs his staff tested. And he clearly hadn't done it if none of them had been tested. It, I, the impression I get, and I have no proof whatsoever for this, but the impression I get is that certain areas of the care home community are looking to be spoon-fed. I think they're looking for somebody to turn up on the door with kits once a week to test everybody. Could be. Look, I've got the quote from Donald McCaskill for this morning. He says here, important to hear Nicola Sturgeon and Marr clearly state that Scottish care homes do not have a higher COVID-19 death rate compared to England. Excess deaths are considered as COVID rather than failure to do so in England. We must learn together to reduce harm rather than point score. As far as I know, neither Donald McCaskill nor Nicola Sturgeon have criticised each other throughout this crisis. No, I think, I think the approach, uh, well, we'll say Nicola Sturgeon, I suppose it's really Gene Freeman's approach to this is a team effort was a very smart move politically because it allowed her not to have to blame anybody in order to protect the government's position. It, allowed her, also, it allowed her to say, we're all in this together. She's also frequently said, I have regular meetings with, Donald McCaskill and others in the care industry. And if there's anything else that they need to bring up, I will have further meetings and they've got access to it. So that's been a clever move as well. My, my impression is that, that if fault lies anywhere, it's going to lie with the communication between certain homes and mm. their local health boards, which yeah, I, I think, think is why Gene Freeman felt obliged to send out that letter, what, two weeks ago? Right. I think, that, I think that's been an ongoing thing, mate. There's been issues with the health board system in Scotland way longer than this. You know, there's issues with Tayside, Lothian. Some obscure spending decisions have been made by Lothian Health Board. And Greater Glasgow's had myriad problems as well. I think there, there may be a case for major reorganisation at some point in the future. I think well, that's certainly something true. else that people forget and I do bang on about a bit, care homes are not hospitals. Not every care home has qualified medical staff in there. You know, yeah. some of them are simply employee carers, and they have no training in this area. Is, that the, I, is that the difference between a nursing home and a care home? Not yeah, even. nursing homes have qualified nursing staff All in right. them. Oh, thanks for that. Care homes are, you know, it's the same people that we know who go round people's houses, cooking yeah. them a meal, helping them get dressed and washed. They're not medical staff. So I there's a, there's an obligation on the management to make sure their staff understand. Well, there was an obligation on the management as well when they realised just how serious this was getting, to provide an extra level of medical care that probably isn't in their homes at the moment, you know, go and hire a, a couple of extra nurses. In fact, they didn't even need to hire them. The Scottish government had provided a bank of returning nurses and that, that they could use. And I, I, as I say, I, you know, they talk about it as if it's one 
system, whereas in fact it's hundreds of systems. Aye, aye. It's, it's all some, under again, one heading. Aye, it's something you know? that will come out of the inquiry, mate. I think the inquiry will clearly show that they weren't prepared for this. They just weren't set up to deal with a virus as um, virulent as this. No, and I probably weren't that, obliged by that, law. No, that's not just their fault. That's the fault of a government at all levels for the pandemic plans that clearly weren't up to scratch. Yeah. But we do have to learn from this and we do have to take the, grab the bull by the horns. It's going to be a nasty, nasty decision to have to take, but there's going to have to be some kind of national care service. And yeah. if it's going to cost you an extra 2% on your national insurance contribution. Well, that, I mean, that, so I've, seen, I've seen that. The issue raised in a in the English only only context. They've, you know they've been asking that on the English politicians. So but yes, it's uh, it's coming. Mm -hmm. But Boris said he had an oven ready solution for carers. <laughs> Sorry, Boris what did you during, mention during, during the election? Uh, Boris I heard them. Everything abject. Oh, it, I mean, he said it in front of Downing Street at a podium. Somebody asked a question about care homes. It was, I don't think it was even to do with the pandemic. I think it was pre-pandemic. Oh, no, no, the election was pre-pandemic, two or three months. And, and he turned around and said, oh, we've got an oven-ready solution to this. We've got a plan. In the oven, them. maybe, might have been the expression he used. I don't think he was using the right oven. But that would be like his oven-ready solution to the Irish border, which is checks, but no checks. They're still saying that. I noticed that on my Michael Gove. Aye, there will be checks, but they're not the kind of checks that Boris said there wouldn't be. God, Absolutely. he was, he, he was, I, I, oh, go. I've got a sneaking admiration for Michael Gove. I, I have to say it. He sits, he, stand, he sits there and just takes it. He does seem to be, he very rarely, he get, very rarely gets flustered. He laughs. He just, That's he how just, he covers it. But he just always sounds like the stupid boy in the corner. It's, you know, and it's schoolboy in the corner. It's not Would quite. You, do you remember the interview he did about Dominic Cummings? And, uh, and it was a guy on Sky, I think, was questioning him. And he, he said it was about the eye testing. And he said, well, I mean, would you drive a car to test your eyes? And right. Gove couldn't help himself. He just burst out laughing. You know, I mean, it's that one where everybody knows it's bullshit, but we're going to keep pretending it isn't. It's the gallus ability to just absolutely lie. I mean, the only... The only way that people progress in the Tory party now, you have to be a mad Brexiteer who is willing to sit there and tell the world that a no-deal Brexit will cause no harm to Britain, even though every single report has said no-deal would be disastrous. They'll sit there and tell you, no, no, no-deal will be fine. We'll be fine. But we'll get a deal. I see the EU started sending out warning notices to British firms detailing what's going to happen regardless of whether they get a deal. So it's all the checks and all the rest of it. Um, the fact that the companies might not be licensed to go trucking about Europe, it's mm. going to be an absolute nightmare. Uh, Do we uh, know uh, yet wh whose land has been bought for this new lorry park in Kent? I according to Gove, it hasn't been that. bought yet. According oh, right. to Gove, it's just been looked at. Ah, well, it'll be like all these other contracts. No tender been done. It's just somebody's pal. Aye, well, that wouldn't surprise me in the least. Not in the least that you find out that somebody has undercut the government, well, in time, I mean, and bought a farm somewhere near the docks at Dover. Ashford. And will now be selling that land to the government ten times for 10 oh, times more. Than exactly. For it's probably it's probably a, a, that much land has to be just an agricultural land for, for, you know, for a huge lorry park out of the blue. Well, the, I got a whiff of compulsory purchase. Somebody wrote an article about this and said that local residents had been told that there was, they were getting no say and people were being moved mm. if one of the plans went through. I, again, I've no, no way to, to prove this. Can you imagine uh, a spare bit of land in Kent, in Ashford, which is on the you know the European the fast train line to Europe, it's close to Dover, that 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 just waiting to be used for lorries. I mean, what happened to that airport airfield they were using before? 
I, I don't I don't know. I think that's quite far away from Dover, is it not? It was a bit far in Malibu, wasn't it? Uh, it's hardly next door. But I, I do think if, well, I think it'll happen. I, I actually think you'll see, you know, these things that the army lay down, these sort of grid things that they lay on grass for, for tanks yeah. and shit to park on. Yeah, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if you see rolls of that heading to Dover round about December time. <clears throat> I suppose you're right. I mean, do the British Army keep stops, stops of that in case they need to invade Germany again? No, they've probably got a pole that's got a shed wood of the stuff, they? Well, they've got, they've got, from they've got huge in, right? warehouses full of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they used to the be RC... able to roll out an airfield in sort of a day and a half. Right, the, RC, the RCT have been... Um, I know a couple of guys that are in the territorials and they've been grafting away throughout this pandemic driving wagons there must be a rather a shortage of lorry drivers in the uk at the moment is this it's delivering ppe del delivering no mate they were delivering milk they were delivering chemicals they were seconded okay. out to companies that were toiling to get drivers <laughs> ah, it's always good use of the working class boys in the army Aye. <coughs> um Anything else that's come up today that caught your eye? Stuart, you said you had something. I just noticed that, well, I'm not going to want to go into it in depth, but um, I know that there is a question about left-wing cultural censorship. No platforming of people. That's now get big, that issue is now becoming mainstream, it would appear. Largely because all these famous writers wrote a letter to Harper's Magazine in the USA, which included J.K. Rowling. So that's an issue. Uh, that's excuse up. me. And uh, it's, I noticed there was an article by Nick Cohen in The Guardian, which is probably worth reading. It's, it's quite a long one, so I'm not going to go into it in any depth. But oh, I read that. It's, you know, it's, I, I think Owen Jones, for example, which, who is the, 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 rising, the rising prince of the left, uh, has been accused of trying to shut down other people that who have from avoid mm. them getting, uh, you know. <laughs> this is linked to the Toby Young thing, isn't it? Aye, Toby Young was Toby, dying, uh, Toby uh, Young isn't happy know. with the uh, BBC you, uh, being excuse run. Me, well, excuse me, I rinsed my mouth out at the mention of that man. Well, he's not happy that it, the BBC is run by. Um, and most of the employees are fascists. He thinks they should all be fascists because his idea of freedom of speech is that fascists get to say what they want and nobody else. Nobody else gets a, a re right a reply. Ah, you're right. I mean, it's to be honest, the whole argument smacks a wee bit to me of obfuscation again. I think they're arguing about they're arguing about people getting cancelled. <laughs> If you spend all the time talking about people getting cancelled, maybe you didn't listen to what those people are actually trying to say. Did you see the I photograph? Think this whole of, taken did you see the photograph of Toby Young, who's remarkably short, uh, facing G Ghislaine Maxwell, and looking straight at her large breasts, and it was something to do about because <laughs> he uh, and somebody had posted old tweets by him. Who, he's got apparently he's got an obsession with global breasts and things. Is that like global pandemic kind of breasts? And, <laughs> global and, breasts. How, how can, and, and somebody else was saying, how can somebody so short be in favour of eugenics? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> is he? Laugh at that one if you like. Is he in favour of eugenics? I, oh, thought he, I thought he came out and said that he definitely wasn't in favour of eugenics. Somebody had accused him of it. I think we've got, in, we've got into this angle uh, on this topic because... Uh, the Freedom of Speech Organization. Come on, one of you guys all know the name, the right wing oh, one. I can't remember. Uh, Toby Young's outfit. Yeah, they're all all the all the all the notorious right wingers that are are involved with it. So the, you know, there. That's why. This argument was won, as far as I'm concerned, when Question Time allowed Nick Griffin on, of the National Front. Yeah, that was years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, but there was a big hoo ha about whether it should be allowed a platform. And they allowed him the platform. And he did 
exactly what everybody hoped he would do. He made a complete and utter arse of himself. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, it, it becomes a problem with fake news, I have to say. But if you get somebody into a position where they have to ask questions on their stance, even the BBC can make a fascist look like a fascist if they so choose. So uh, Toby Young can go on question time anytime he wants. Some so of it, Fred, I've got some, something that might be worrying in the, in the medium to long term, maybe before uh, next May. Um, the report today that the Leave UK organization, Aaron Banks, Wigmore, or whatever his name is, the, the whole crew, Raj crew, uh, they're um, backing the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand against Jacinda Ahern, who's very popular and very, very popular amongst liberal governments. Now, they're investing a lot of money on this guy to replace her because they like him, because he's much more right wing. Now, if they're prepared to do that in, in New Zealand, would they pour money into Scotland for the next May's election? That's, that's my question. No. What they might do is pour money into a, better, a new Better Together campaign. Because they already have control of the UK. So basically, they just want to keep control of Scotland. I can't see them going into Scotland to... I can't to see them no, jump into Scottish politics because where did they put the money? They're not going to put money behind Jackson Carlo. They're not going to put money behind Richard Leonard. There's nobody to put it. What this other thought? Who's, who's George, the... Gorgeous George. <laughs> That's that's I've seen a couple of people on Twitter going on a bit how how gorgeous George could um, revitalise unionism in Scotland, and I thought you got to be a particular special kind of stupid to believe that anybody in Scotland has any time for George Galloway. Well, apparently, apparently he's announced the fact that he's interested in getting back, getting back into Scottish politics. Apparently, he's moved back to Scotland. He's interested in getting his face in the papers, mate. That's all George is interested in. He's, he's got no credibility whatsoever. He's got no policies. He might be getting a little bit broke because he's he not sued anybody for a while. I love that yeah. photograph that's going around with him and, uh, oh God, what's his name? The actor? Aaron Banks. No. No, oh, no, Ford, no. The actor. Ford Kiernan. Ford Kiernan. Aye. 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 They played that stupid Ronald Villiers character in yeah. June the past. Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say, your, your voice today, right. Jimmy, sounds exactly like that character. Very oh, deep yeah. and very, go very golden. Very hungover. <laughs> That's what that is. So we're, I, we're, I think... we're not worried about George coming back then. Nah. I'd, welcome it. I'd welcome it with open arms, mate, when, when you can post pictures of... I mean, fair play, he's, he's had an interesting career, shall we say, but you can post pictures of him hugging Nigel Farage and Steve Bannon. He's not getting any votes in Scotland. I, I, it, he's such a, an extreme character. He did really, really well uh, when he was up in front of that committee in America. Mm -hmm. Tore them to shreds. And then he went about licking up milk out of saucer in a red leotard. Oh, I know. He's, yeah. a, you know. He's, he's a bit marmite, mate, but, unfor but unfortunately for George, the public seen through him a long time ago, mate. Like you say, he's probably skinned anything that'll get his face in the papers and maybe get him a few quid for anybody that's going to fund him. Is he divorced again? No idea. I don't think so, but he's got Dundee roots, hasn't he? Aye, who was it told us the tale of going to join the Labour Party and George taking the, the money? It was the Labour Party or a union or something. And George took the money and said to his mate, right, we've got money for a couple of pints now. Who was yeah. that? Somebody told us that on radio years you ago. You better be careful. You could get sued for saying that. I can't. I, somebody, somebody I trust, <laughs> I wouldn't repeat it. You might be surprised who's listening. Well, he can sue me if he wants. Right. Well, you wear a well, you wear a cat costume. Or you could wear the dog costume at court, mate. Aye, that's what I'll do. And I'll bugger him. Mm. Uh, I'm beyond. <coughs> I'm now at the point in my life where I don't care if anybody sues me. Right. I've not got anything for them to get anyway. Mm. Um, anything else come up today? Well, good, I've got one good st good story. Uh, 
good story. Uh, Scottish as well, a Motherwell pilot has survived COVID and become a, a, a celebrity in Vietnam. He's the most, he, went, he went across to Vietnam to start work as a pilot with the Vietnam <clears throat> domestic airline, caught COVID, and he was, he's been, he was in a coma for weeks and weeks and weeks. They have no deaths at all in Vietnam. From COVID. Two months he was in a coma. Two months in a, in a coma, and, uh, and he's now been sent on a plane back to the UK. I don't know if he's arrived back here yet, but uh, good on him. Mm. And, uh, well, done. Right. and well done the Vietnamese for keeping him alive. They kept him alive. Yeah. They, they only gave him a 10% <laughs> chance of survival, and they, they said they, all, they might need a double lung transplant, but I don't know. Don't uh, get tough in Motherwell, obviously. Uh, it's not a caption competition. But if you look over my which shoulder, that shoulder, <laughs> you'll see a picture of Donald Trump and his uh, <coughs> and his entourage with face masks on, and it isn't uh -huh. it isn't a Photoshop job; it's the real thing. But I I was wondering which Tarantino film music would would go with that, because that was the first thing when I saw it. The music from. Reservoir Dogs. Love Reservoir you, Dogs. Me, hey. Reservoir Dogs popped straight into my head. Because it's actually a, a still from a video of them marching yeah. down the corridor. I, I, I've got the caption already. Hold hands, it's a stick-up. <laughs> yeah. right, that wins second prize. I, <laughs> I, I was actually, I, I fully expect at some point down the road for Donald Trump to claim that that was photoshopped when some other news comes out about face masks. Should England make face masks compulsory by law? Well, Gove said they're not going to. That means they will. Right, every chance that they will once Gove said it when it happened. But... Can we expect an announcement tomorrow then? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So that, that's very, uh, I'm, uh, I thought this would be quite a fiery one, this one, but it seems to have been quite sensible. Aye, aye. My hangovers may be making me a bit more sensible than normal, but... Oh, well, I've got an announcement to make. I managed to get up a hill yesterday. Well, not all the way at the top, but considerably further than I ever thought I would. So I'm pleased. I've got spare legs, though. Charge on. Well done. Uh, well, I got my motorised wheelchair thing, boys, so... All right. Charge on. I will come along and um, attach the knife to the wheels and that for you. Aye, well... Mm. It's a kind of domestic thing, so I'm not sure that I'll be able to do the knives thing. I might just have to carry my own machine gun. Well, if you want to go out together, and I, I, you, can, you can lend me your scooter, so we'll go, we can, you know, little and large. Scooter's been passed on. <laughs> it's me. <coughs> Scooter's been passed on to Becky. All right. Who is using it to get from Pilton to St. Andrew's Square for her work. Very good. Um, and it seems to be working quite well. As long as there's no, ra as long as there's no raining. Mm. Aye, well, I did warn her about uh, metal objects in the pavement get very slidey in the rain. Mm. So you've got to be careful. I've got a wee, remember the lassie that does the, well, she does the actions to Trump's voice from America. Mm -hmm. You'll recognize her. She's, she's got a wee thing, a new one. So I think we'll play out with that, guys. Okay. Thanks, Owen. Um, so thanks for joining me, Stuart Lockhead, Jimmy Hunt. Hello. I'm Nori uh, Stuart. Okay, I'm going to say um, a wee shout out to Jeff, if, uh, who might be one of our new listeners and viewers. All right. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Do we know Jeff? i am just met him on yesterday. So Sunday. All right. Okay. Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed it, Jeff. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll catch up with everybody tomorrow monday god monday already and uh hopefully by that time the border between england and scotland will be well and truly shut <laughs> here's here's a, a wee clip uh taking the mick out of donald trump do 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 do
Here we go. So if there is an economic benefit, sir, and there is a public health benefit, sir, why not go forward and, and say there should be mandatory masks all across this country? Well, I don't know if you need mandatory because you have many places in the country where people stay very long distance. You talk about social distancing, but I'm all for masks. I think masks are good. I would wear, if I were in a group of people and I was close. You would wear one. Oh, I would, I would, oh, I have. I mean, people have seen me wearing one. If I'm in a group of people where we're not, you know, 10 feet away, and but usually I'm not in that position, and everyone's tested. Because I'm the president, they get tested before they see me. But if I were in a tight situation with people, I would absolutely. Do you think the public will see that at some point? I mean, I'd have no problem. Actually, I, I had a mask on. I sort of liked the way I looked. Okay, I thought it was okay. It was a dark black mask and I thought it looked okay. It looked like the Lone Ranger. But uh, no, I have no problem with that. I think, uh, and if people feel good about it, they should do it. <laughs> Only Donald Trump looked like the Lone Ranger. <laughs> well, looked a bit like the Lone Ranger. Well, that cheered me up. We'll call it a day at that. Thanks for listening, folks. Catch you on Monday.